as I was muted the whole time. Yes, well, we've got we've got the we've got the YouTube all set up here. Yeah. So the, yeah, then you weren't recorded all that time, which is yeah. Now, Ryan, so I'm sorry that uh, the, 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 this is conflicting with your other conference today. Oh, yeah, that's my fault. Well, no, we should have caught that a long time ago, but somehow we didn't. Mm -hmm. Wait, did, oh. did we not? I thought we booked this before that, that other conference existed. Maybe I'm wrong about that. I think we booked it before the dates were fixed, maybe. Maybe. I'm not sure what I'm not sure what happened. Maybe. It was probably just my own incompetence. I think it's a fair <laughs> assumption. Anyway, anyway we're glad that, that you're able to... they said it was not possible to change the, the talks over there to avoid the conflict. Yeah, yeah, because you're in two places, so mm. too bad. Sheldon, are you hosting today? Or Andrew? No, uh, I think I assume Andy is. So. I am, yeah, yeah. Okay, good. Yeah, so it's all under control. Yeah, but actually, Ron, can you can you uh, make me the host? I thought I thought it checked and you were. Let Be me right back one second. Um, Here it says you are. Yeah, yeah, yeah you're uh, you're listed as the host. So if you could just transfer back to Andy. Uh, yeah, co-host. Sorry, that'll work. I just make you real host, not just co-host. Yeah, that'll save us some trouble at the end. Right. Great. Thanks, Ron. Okay. Let's see, maybe I'll wait. I'll wait just one minute for people to trickle in, and then. Okay. Sure. Yeah, I, I'm ready. All right. Well, all right, let's let's kick it off. So um, so welcome everyone or welcome back to the Western Hemisphere Colloquium for Geometry and Physics. Um, our speaker today is Ryan Thorngren, who will tell us about a tour of categorical symmetry. Um, so the, the talk is uh, 60 minutes and then there's about 15 minutes uh, for questions, but uh, also feel free to just, uh, um, if you have a question in the, in the middle of the talk, feel free to speak up. Um, so. Take it away, Ryan. Thanks very much. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much um, for the invitation to come speak here. Uh, I'm going to give you a what I hope is an accessible overview to a topic I've been thinking about for the last couple of years. I gave some archive references. Is here. There's. Uh, I have to uh, acknowledge my brilliant collaborators: Ethan Wang, Sue Flickman, Nathaniel Linder, Andy Stern, and Ares Berg. Um, these first two are a bit more abstract, more like what I'll cover today. And this, this uh, third paper here is like dense matter applications to the subject. So just straight up with the definition, what I, what I want to define is a categorical symmetry is a category that acts as a symmetry. And here it's gonna act as a symmetry of a quantum field theory. So we're gonna lo use locality properties to uh, explain why we have a category. And in this talk, I'm going to tell you about that, what it means, uh, why I'm interested in studying it, uh, why I think it's interesting. Uh, I'll tell you about some bulk boundary correspondence for these symmetries, which allows us to do things that we like to do with symmetries, like classify gapped phases, think about anomalies, uh, gauge the symmetries. And then hopefully if I have time, I'll give you uh, some of the examples that we've learned from central charge one CFTs in one plus one dimension. So the most familiar notions of symmetry are tied to transformations of something that could be transformations of space like translation or rotations. In classical mechanics, we have, or, or even more generally than classical mechanics, 
more generally in transformations of space, we should think about transformations of configuration space. So here I write it as M. So we have some group that acts on our configurations in a sense that it preserves the dynamics. So in classical mechanics, M is a symplectic manifold, G acts by symplectomorphisms, and the equations of motion, time evolution of configurations, these configurations are a snapshot of the system, are given by Hamiltonian flow by some function that we choose that specifies the dynamics called the Hamiltonian. So just some real valued smooth function on M. And the statement that G is a symmetry is just that this function is invariant under the action of G. And in cases that G is a Lie group, which we're often interested in, and it's a smooth map, then there can be an extra nice situation where the action is Hamiltonian, which means that there's another function Q, there's going to be a Q associated to each Lie algebra generator, which generates the infinitesimal action by Hamiltonian flow now by Q. And so if we think about um, this charge, this, this Q, it's conserved in the sense that if we look at the time derivative of Q, so we, that's time evolution is generated by the Hamiltonian. So that's the same as this plus on bracket, but that's also how Q generates the transformation of H. So that's also dH dS where S is the parameter under flow by Q and that's zero by the assumption of symmetry. So actually this whole equation says that if we're thinking about Hamiltonian actions, having a symmetry is the same thing as having a conserved charge conserved in the sense that the time derivative is zero. So that's another theorem. It's gonna play a central role. Uh, in quantum mechanics, Noether's theorem is actually built into how we set up the problem. So in that case, M is something like the projective Hilbert space. So the states of this, the space of rays in some Hilbert space H are the uh, equation of motion is the Schrodinger equation. It's given by now a choice of Hermitian operator, but it's the same as a, it plays the same role as the H we had before. And this, the state just evolves by unitary rotations generated by the Hermitian operator. A symmetry, uh, an action on configuration space in this case is a, is a projective unitary representation of our symmetry group. And the statement that the Hamiltonian is preserved by the group action is simply that the, the way these group elements are represented, they're represented by operators which commute with H. And there's a kind of another theorem here as well. Like if we just, if we study a, a Lie group acting um, with a smooth action, then we write our Lie group element as the exponential of some uh, Lie algebra generators T, some parameters theta, that rho we can bring into the, into the exponent here. And so we get some, some operators rho of the Lie algebra generators. I call it rho by abusive notation. And this, this commutation relation actually tells us that the time derivative of rho as it evolves according to the Schrodinger equation. So this is like Heisenberg picture. The evolution of the, of the operator is the commutator and the commutator is zero because it's a symmetry. So here we did not even need to assume something like a Hamiltonian group action. We get we get Noether's theorem for free. It's, it's built in. In classical field theory, things are a little bit more complicated again. So here, I'm gonna consider a restricted version of, of classical field theory, um, where we still have something like a symplectic uh, space of configurations, but now it's like infinite dimensional. It's something like sections of a bundle over some space. And I wanna consider Hamiltonians, which are, which are integrals of some local density defined on space where local density, this is some form where uh, it depends, its value at a point depends only on say like the jet of phi or like the germ of phi at that point. So on phi and all of its derivatives at that point, say. Or you can work in the uh, Lagrangian framework as well. And if we have nice symmetries that come from actions of the fibers of this bundle, so these are like internal symmetries. They don't move the space-time points around. Then we get a conserved charge, just like in Noether's theorem, except now we get something extra, which is we get a charge density, little q. So this is a way that we can express the total charge as the integral of some local charge, again, some local density. And Noether's theorem tells us that 
dq dt is zero. And so the integral of d little q dt is zero. So by uh, the divergence theorem, if you like, or Poincaré lemma, there's some form j so that dq dt is exact. So this is a, this is a strengthening of Noether's theorem. This is like a, a local conservation of charge. It says not only is the total charge conserved, but the only way for a charge density to change here is for a charge to flow somewhere else. So this J is our current. If we pass to space time, which is a useful thing to do uh, <laughs> for field theory, we can collect Q and J into a D minus one form, which I'll call capital J. And now this conservation law that we had is simply written as, uh, as this equation that J is closed. And that's equivalent to having the symmetry. So what we get is we get a family of what I'll call topological operators. If I say something like topological defect or topological surface or something like that, I'll just mean some kind of operator, something that we can either measure or which acts on the system. And I'll say how it acts which is expressed as the integral of J now over, over a general um, D minus one cycle. So not, not just space, but any D, D minus one cycle in space time is fair game for this form. And the fact that J is closed tells us this integral only depends on the topology of Y. It only depends on its homology class. And through that chain of logic, this is the same as the conservation of J. It's the same as the, sim as the symmetry. So we're saying that continuous symmetries here are equivalent really to having topological operators of, the, of this type. And actually uh, non-continuously discrete symmetries also fit into this framework. If we have a discrete symmetry, we can form a co-dimension one topological defect by defining a boundary condition where you have fields on one side and you have fields transformed by G on the other side. And this would give us a co-dimension one defect labeled by the group element G. This would also be a topological operator by the fact that it's a symmetry. So what I want to do is I want to define a symmetry, like the sym I want to define the symmetries of a quantum field theory as the collection of its topological operators. And the reason why I want to do that is that I can't always think in terms of these like actions on the fields. Uh, there might not be a classical limit of my field theory, or there could be several classical limits so that uh, you get a different set of symmetries um, depending on which classical limit you take if you were just thinking about group actions. So it's really, it's, it's not well-defined to talk about the symmetries of the fields, but it is well-defined to talk about the topological operators. And hopefully I'm gonna convince you that they're like symmetries. I can, I can do symmetry-like things with them so let's, let's do an example. So I'll come back to this example a couple of times. Let's take a, a sigma model in D space-time dimensions where the target is a circle. So the field, the field is, is a map from space-time into the circle. And we'll give it uh, the simplest action we can come up with, which is, which is the, the norm of the exterior derivative here or, or D phi wedge star G phi. Um, there's an ordinary symmetry, which is apparent which is, you can think of it as rotation of the circle. What it does is it shifts, it shifts phi by a constant and it has a conserved current, which is star d phi. You can check that it's conserved uh, by studying the equation of motion. Equation of motion here, it says phi is harmonic. So it says dj is zero, which is the conservation law. But this theory also has a, has a one form current. I call it a current, uh, I'll write it as, as d phi. Um, it's conserved in the sense that uh, D of this current is zero just for topological reasons. It's, only, it's just because D squared is zero. But you might not want to consider it as a symmetry because it doesn't act on any operator that you can write in terms of phi. If you just write some function of phi and you say, I'm gonna study this operator, it, it's not going to be, uh, D phi is not gonna generate a symmetry that acts on it. So you might say that it's somehow trivial. And indeed, if phi is smooth and we integrate around any contractible loop, we'll get, uh, we'll get that this integral is zero. But actually on non-contractible loops, phi can have a winding number. So 
the integral of this current, in other words, the, the charge can be any integer. So here's an example, right? So this is just this radial vector field. Uh, I am expressing phi as an angle here. So at the origin, the angle is not defined. So this is R2 minus the origin and right, this integral around any loop that doesn't, con doesn't contain the point is zero, but the integral around here is, is like say plus one, <laughs> depending on the way you do it. So this, this operator, this is uh, what we want to think of as, as the symmetry operator U, um, it only acts on these kind of like funny observables. And we can certainly define these observables. They are variously called disorder operators or twist operators. And the way we define them in general is we remove some codimension to submanifold, and maybe actually we remove the neighborhood of the submanifold and impose certain winding, certain boundary conditions along the, uh, now we've removed a piece and so now we have a boundary. We impose boundary conditions so that if you look locally in this, uh, locally on this um, thing that we've removed, locally there's a, there's a, just a product with an S1 and we can impose boundary conditions so that phi winds around this S1. So these operators describe vortices, which are physical. Like here is, here's actually a picture of some vortices um, in a superconductor of some kind. And these vortices are inserted into the system kind of like by, by putting in a magnetic field, they're something extrinsic that we add to the system. They, and then we can study how the system responds to them. So they're like infinitely massive in this, in this circle theory, but in real life, they move around and stuff. And we really want them in the theory. And one reason is T duality. So there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a duality between the theory whose target is a circle and the theory whose target is a different circle with essentially inverse the radius where the relation between the fields, so phi is our original field and phi tilde is the, is the dual field, they're related in this way um, through the Hodge star. So this is in one plus one D. So these are both one forms here. And in the dual variables, in the, in the phi tilde variables, one aspect of this duality is that you can write the vortex as a function, actually just as a, as a ordinary sort of observable in the dual variables. And this means that if you just have the quantum field theory, if you don't know whether it's described in terms of phi or phi tilde, you'd have no reason to prefer one description over the other. And so no description of the, of the theory, of the symmetry of the theory is complete without including this kind of hidden symmetry, which measures these winding numbers. And I'd like to say there's no reason not to include d phi among the set of currents for space-time dimension more than two either. So in that case, it's not like an ordinary conserved one form, but still is a symmetry. And I'll, con I'll, I'll show you, uh, so d phi doesn't act on anything that you can write in terms of phi. Uh, and here I used a duality that works only in 2D, but in higher dimensions, there, there is a duality like that which is some kind of particle vortex duality where now d phi is a one form. So if I want to write it as a star D of something, that something has to be a D minus two form. And it turns out that the thing that works is uh, one of these higher form gauge fields, it's a billion U1 gauge field. And it satisfies this relation. So the symmetry that's generated by this current d phi it actually does act on A, like if, if you study the canonical commutation relations of what, this, of what this line operator does, it turns out that it shifts A by a flat D minus two form connection. And the way that works is that it's basically by Poincaré duality. Like if I write, uh, if I write this integral of star D A, so it's integrated around some curve, that 
this is this is related to like the lambda that you get out of here is is the one that uh, here maybe there's e to the i theta times this thing. So lambda is going to be defined by having holonomy theta around uh, around gamma, and so this acts on the field in this way. It's not a gauge transformation, right? Because you can have flat flat connections, which are not just uh, gauge exact. So really, it's global symmetry, and although it doesn't act on any local operators, we still consider it as a symmetry. It acts in this case on these Wilson operators that you can define by integrating your gauge field against some D minus two cycle. So in 3D, this is just Maxwell theory, and this is just the usual Wilson line. Okay, maybe I'll pause for a couple of seconds for questions before I get into a little more abstract picture. I guess there could be anti-linear versions of all this. And did you, you, you said that the symmetry in quantum mechanics has rho of G commuting with the Hamiltonian. Yeah, you, okay, yeah, you, you mean, mean, you mean like time G reversal. Anti-commute, yeah, that kind of thing. Yeah, so I think only, uh, I don't think it makes sense to study anti-linear symmetries associated to higher co-dimension objects than one. Why not? But, but certainly, well, I just don't know how you would do it. Like the, the way that it acts on Hilbert space. Why couldn't it complex this way. conjugate? I mean, if there's a conjugation symmetry on your category of Wilson lines, couldn't it? Yeah, but I think that would actually come from a zero form symmetry. Certainly zero form symmetries. So not to lose everybody, the, 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 the ordinary kinds of symmetries that we're used to that act on local operators, they can also act on line operators. So time reversal, charge conjugation, those things uh, do tend to act on your Wilson tipped operators. But I don't know if there's like line operator versions of that. It's an interesting question. Yeah, I don't know. I don't have a good answer, but uh, it's a good question. Okay, let's move into the description of these objects. So um, now we want to address this problem. So say, say we want to now describe the set of topological operators of a theory. How do we actually do that? What does the answer to that question look like? Well, I can tell you one version. Uh, let's maybe stick to one plus one dimension because I can draw there, but really uh, some structure like this is going to exist in all dimensions. And here we're interested in lines. So every line is gonna carry some label A. We'll just draw it like that. And when I draw these pictures, what I mean is that, well, let me tell you what I mean before I, uh, after I tell you some more things. This set is gonna form a linear category with some homomorphisms that are given by topological point operators between the lines, which means that if I have some line A and some line B, I can study junctions between them. These are local operators and any such operator, which is topological in the sense that I can move it around is Going to be uh, is going to define this HOM set for me. It's actually a vector space, so this is a linear category. And perhaps most importantly, there's a fusion of lines. So there's, if I take two lines very close together and I zoom out, there's like an operator product expansion where this is a sum. Sorry for the mess, which is a sum over line C. With uh, you can think about there as being some some fusion coefficients and ABC here. And these fusion coefficients are actually the dimensions of some, some vector space of point junctions as well. They're junctions between, between three lines. So if we consider A, B, and C, so where C is something in the fusion uh, product of A and B, then it means that we actually have a local junction so just from having these fusion rules and describing the lines this way, we automatically get that fusion is local. We can, we can make these fusions by uh, fusing just parts of the lines together and it satisfies the rules. Could I ask, could, could you, can you have lower dimensional defects in that operator product expansion? Um, I think not if I write it this way, because, well, they, they look like lines. Uh, I guess you could have, um, you could have point defects inserted because it doesn't depend on where they are. 
No, I mean in the sum over C, could some of the objects on the site in that right hand side actually be zero dimensional? So I don't know any examples like that, but I also haven't looked for them. There are there are situations where the uh, fusion rules mix, but usually what it means is that like well, I can't draw a an example in one plus one dimension, but for instance, uh, yeah, when you start to when you start to have things like several planes meeting, then you can also have lines that want to meet there. Yeah, there's nothing obvious to me that uh, forbids it. So let's say that it's there, but I'm not describing it right now. Right now, I want to describe that in the absence of point operators. And there's also this important piece, piece of data, which um, has a lot of names. It's uh, if we consider a piece of a correlation function. So imagine that this this network of lines occurs inside some correlation function where we have kind of local operators and other things inserted outside of what I've drawn. We expect that if the, if the lines can fuse in this pattern that they can also fuse in the other pattern, which looks like so, where again, we're gonna have to sum over, we're gonna have to sum over this, line here. So the outer legs are fixed and there's going to be some coefficient here, which I like to call the F symbol, but it also goes under the name, the crossing kernel or the six J symbol. And this is, this piece of data actually follows from the absence of point operators, but let me not, let me not argue it right now. I'll just mention that for symmetry groups, what's going on is all of these lines are going to be labeled by group elements, right? G1, G2, G3, and so on. The rule for fusion here is going to ensure that at any vertex, we have that, that if we go say, these all should come with orientations, that if we go around this vertex, G1 times G3 times G2 is the identity. And when we look at this crossing relation, what it gives us is there can be some phase factor here. So C will be totally determined by the, by the group law, but there can still be some phase factor here. And that phase factor is actually the Tooth anomaly for this, uh, for the symmetry group. And if we study the consistency conditions for the F symbols, we find that the phase factor here is a group three co-cycle. So it's exactly the thing that you expect to, um, to capture the anomaly. And there is indeed a category that you can associate to the data of the group and the anomaly. And that's this category of G graded vector spaces where the tensor product of these vector spaces is, uh, has a non-trivial associator defined by this omega. So the data of all of this, the data of uh, the, the fusion product and the F symbol gives this category of lines, the structure of a monoidal category. This is the definition of a monoidal category. It has a close relationship to the, there's a sense of like a category of quantum field theories. If I think about quantum field theories, I can think about topological junctions between them. So here I'm drawing two, uh, whoops. Here I'm drawing two two-dimensional quantum field theories and some line-like junction between them. And the junctions themselves form a category where you can have junctions between junctions. So this whole structure, this whole structure is like some kind of two category. So you can think about this junction as a morphism, this junction as a morphism, and this junction of junctions as a two morphism. And if you study higher dimensions, we expect something similar that like d-dimensional quantum field theories will form some kind of d category. And the kind of structure we're looking at is endomorphisms of our theory of interest inside this d category. And generally speaking, endomorphisms in the d category form a monoidal d minus one category. So we want something like that, but actually it's quite mathematically difficult uh, to describe. Well, at least, at least I'm not qualified to do it. 
Um, but that's what we, that's the kind of structure we expect to have um, in all dimensions. I think there was a, there's a question in the chat. Uh, Simeon asks, are you claiming it's possible to write a junction between any two QFTs? No. Um, these are just objects in some category. There's no, there's no guarantee that uh, there's going to be a morphism between these objects. Yeah, thanks for the question. Okay, so we've described the set of topological operators, but you, but you may have asked like, okay, well, I only really care about invertible topological operators perhaps. And invertible topological operators, everything can be described in terms of groups or higher groups, you know, things, things that are like groups that we're more or less familiar with. But I wanna convince you that the non-topological operators are also interesting. And one immediate thing about them is, well, they're also preserved by dualities. So if we want to say that two theories are dual, you know, we have all these checks in them, like to check the global symmetry, see that the anomalies match and all these things. You can also check that they have the same set of topological operators. And they also help us to constrain our normalization group flows, which are generated by, uh, I'll define what this means, symmetric perturbations. And what a symmetric perturbation is, is say we have some topological operator and this O is some local operator. It's going to be, we're gonna consider this local operator symmetric oops, if it can move through, if it can move through the, uh, yeah, if it, if it can move through the topological operator without changing the value of the correlation function. So this is just like what it is uh, for ordinary group symmetries. We just say the same thing for these non-invertible guys. And if we have this, then this operator will continue to be topological along the RG flow generated by this operator, by O. And actually you can prove something stronger. You can say that the entire data of, here this is supposed to be curly A, the entire data of our monoidal category is going to be preserved. And so that includes things like the F symbol, which I said is um, related to the anomaly when you, or it is the anomaly if you study group-like symmetries. And so you can think about this as like some generalization of the anomaly matching. So or could, you, could you say more precisely what it means to have a symmetric perturbation theory? It, it just means that the, I mean, it, look, it almost looks topological. It means that the topological operators remain topological. Yeah, but you can, you can test it locally by studying how the topological operators act on your Hilbert space. In, in this picture, you move the line across the operator, right? Not the other way. In other words, the operator, the operator might not be topological. It just stays at some point and you move the topological operator across. Oh it. yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. It's related to this action by wrapping, but it's not exactly the same. I'm going to say more about it on the next slide. I agree, it's nearly, it's nearly tautological, but uh, we do get somewhere <laughs> like Tift anomaly matching, which I think you'd agree is interesting. So here's, here's, a, here's another example in, in one plus one dimension that we can actually do completely explicitly on the lattice if we want to. And I'm not saying we necessarily want to in this talk, but just to give you a taste, we have uh, this very famous Hamiltonian. It's self-dual. So first of all, it has, it has, a, it has a group like symmetry, which is given by the, the product of the, these are poly matrices. So the product of the poly Zs, so this Hamiltonian. And moreover, if we gauge that Z2 symmetry, the, the model is self-dual. And you can actually realize that transformation on the lattice as a isomorphism of Pauli algebras where you map X to a half infinite string of Zs and you map Z to this uh, product of two Xs and you can show that these satisfy the, the, um, kind of the commutation relations and that H is mapped to itself just with tildes. What it does is it exchanges the two terms. So this transformation 
it's in it's a sense it's a symmetry of the Hamiltonian, but it's not an invertible symmetry because it doesn't preserve the set of local operators. So this transformation from X into a half infinite string, you know, this is uh, this is also called the disorder operator. It's not a local operator in your theory, right? So there's there's no way to say that there is an invertible action on the Hilbert space, say the Hilbert space of a circle, where you want to say um, you want to say where every local operator maps to some other local operator. That's just not what happens here. So what does happen here? Again, we can draw this little picture with uh, with the correlation function. And here now, as uh, as Andy suggested, I should move the line past the <laughs> local operator and leave it there. And as I do that, first I can kind of deform it into this little bubble. And then you'll notice in this even smaller region, there's something that we can apply the crossing relation to. So if we do that, we get some sum, we get some factor of the F symbols. And what we're summing over uh, are lines here in between that are basically uh, all of the lines inside the tensor product of of A and A dual. I don't think I told you what A is. This is A. So what's happening here is that in this transformation is that if this is the order parameter, so let's call it sigma. Actually, there's a lot of sigmas. Let me call it, uh, let me call it by the lattice name. So if this is X, then what the string is, this is the string of Zs. And we recognize that as that's that's a, that's a topological defect. That's the topological defect corresponding to the Z2 symmetry. So if we write that topological defect as epsilon, so epsilon is this Z2 guy. So epsilon times epsilon is the identity, which would be an invisible um, topological defect. Then this other guy, which, uh, which is not a here. Now it's a uh, sigma is the one standard name for this uh, topological operator. That in order to see what sigma squared is, we should basically see where where what happens to all the operators. And there are operators that map to the end of um, end of epsilon lines. So epsilon has to be in here. But there's also operators that are are mapped to local operators. And so the the identity has to be here as well. And those are the only other that uh, accounts for all of the all of the action, and you derive this fusion rule: sigma times sigma is one plus epsilon. So this is a typical kind of fusion rule for a non-invertible topological operator. And one interesting thing about this is uh, there's two consistent choices for the f symbol, and so that gives you like the that gives you an extra invariant of the theory, and it turns out that only one of them is realized by the Ising CFT. The other one is realized by some different CFTs. So that's like an extra uh, anomaly that you have to match. Yes, I think there's a question, Yvonne. Uh, hi, um, I just wanted to ask real quick. So it seems from this example that the existence of non-invertible topological operators is really because we're gauging non-invertibility from the wrong criteria, right? From the from a local criteria, but in here, you know, there seems to be an invertible uh, action on the global algebra of operators of your theory, right? So that's sort of always true. Um, here, it's it's more true because this is really self duality under Z two gauging. There's always a way to kind of make things local, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. But there can be there can be symmetry actions that don't really look like gauging any kind of group, at least in one plus one dimension so far. But that's right. There's some. There's a, there's a well-defined action on all of the operators. It's just that they don't. It doesn't exactly preserve locality, and that manifests itself algebraically as non-invertibility. Right, but, it, but 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 if we were just looking at the algebra of operators, including both local and non-local operators, if we just looked at the algebra as in the, the set of all operators in this huge lattice, uh, then then it is uh, vertical. Well, what you find, yeah, but that's that's actually not uh, there's 
Okay, yeah, it's true. Did I answer your question? Yes, <laughs> I agree with yes, you. yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay, cool. Um, right, so a little bit more about this. So the there's so I've, I've said that the order parameter is, is mapped to a non-local operator, so it, it doesn't count as symmetric under our definition. And there's one other relevant operator in the theory, which is this energy operator. It's just like the Hamiltonian, except with a sign. And this operator tunes us between the ordered phase and the disordered phase. And if you think about this uh, duality that I told you about, what it does is it exchanges these two phases. So we know this operator can't be symmetric either. So it's actually, you show that it's odd under uh, this transformation. It's mapped to its, itself with a minus sign. The transformation just exchanges these two guys. And so we get an interesting phase diagram where this Ising CFT is actually a stable gapless phase. And if I were to, um, there are various ways to get out of this stable gapless phase, but I definitely need to uh, tune some non-perturbatively large uh, operator. And one way to do that is to tune through this 7 tenths tricriticalizing CFT. And what we find on the other side is a gapped phase with, with three ground states. And we can understand this inside uh, the larger Z2 symmetric phase diagram where we do allow this energy operator as there is a disordered phase up here, the ordered phase down here, and duality, this kramer zwani transformation acts by reflection in this phase diagram. So only this horizontal axis is symmetric. And here this gapped state is, here it plays the role of the first order transition between the ordered and disordered phases. But from the point of view of the non-invertible symmetry, it's a stable phase. And it's one where this symmetry is spontaneously broken. OK. So why might <laughs> we can, of course, tune. What we've done here is we've tuned this operator by hand to 0 to get somewhere where the uh, non-invertible symmetry is at least emergent. But these symmetries occur naturally at the boundary of topological field theories, which was how I got interested in them. So if, if our symmetry category is suitably finite, so for instance, if it forms a fusion category, and you don't have to worry about that is, then we can define, we can define a TQFT using it by a state sum called the Terai Vera model. There's also a Hamiltonian version called Levin Wen. And intuitively, the partition function of this TQFT is a sum over networks where co-dimension k parts of the network are labeled by k minus one morphisms. You can actually think about the whole diagram of the whole network as uh, a diagram in some D category that we make out of A just by making the A's, A as the endos of the unique object. And in particular, all of the zero dimensional junctions can be written as an F symbol. If you have a generic uh, diagram, you resolve all the crossings as best you can, then we get a bunch of F symbols from all the zero dimensional junctions and the weight of this diagram in the sum is given by the product of all of these numbers. And the state sum is gonna be well-defined because there are only finitely many topological classes of networks. So it all reduces to a finite sum. So here's a picture of like a junction, a uh, point-like junction between surfaces in three dimensions. So it's dual to a tetrahedron. You see there's six guys meeting and the F symbol that's hiding here can be revealed by slicing it with a plane and then moving that plane through the singularity, you see that the intersection points are just like our graph and it performs this crossing relation as it goes through. And so the, the F symbol associated with this motion is going to be the weight of this singularity in the state sum. So here's a proposition, which is that D-dimensional theories with categorical symmetry A are in bijection with boundary theories of this uh, TQFT, which I call Terai Vero theory, defined by a reasonable. So, sorry, can I ask a question? Have you yes. defined what a categorical symmetry is? 
I said it's a category that acts as a symmetry, and then I told you that uh, we get you those that, by you said that at the very, very operators. Beginning. You said that at the very beginning, but I, I thought that was a teaser. We're, yeah, so I got I gave you a category of topological operators, and I told you you should think about them as symmetries. So that's my categorical symmetry. But that's your Sorry, category. That wasn't clear. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And and what kind of category does A have to be? So here it needs to be something like a like a fusion D category, which I don't know exactly what it means, or D minus one category. I'm not sure exactly what that means, but it's something like a monoidal category, which is finite enough that the state sum makes sense. So finitely many simple objects and dualizability. I think that's all you need. So if we have a theory with the symmetry, then here, here's how the proof goes. If we have a theory with the symmetry, we can produce a boundary theory by letting the, so here I write it in, in this one plus one D language because it's easier to, it's just less cumbersome. You can say, so you have bulk surfaces which are labeled by your line types where they meet the boundary. We just say that uh, we put the line of that label on the boundary. Right, so we have a theory with categorical symmetry. It has lines uh, labeled by elements of A, and the network is going to be topologically invariant, and the state sum is well defined. Why? Well, of course, we can certainly move the network around, but we might be worried about instances where these singularities pass through the boundary because that's going to change the state sum. But the F symbol of the boundary actually exactly compensates this by how we've defined the weight of the state sum. So you can see as this, if you think about this plane now is where the boundary lives and the backside of it as uh, the vacuum, that as, this sing as a singularity leaves through some topological motion of the network, you get this F symbol is performed on the boundary lines and the, uh, everything exactly cancels. So you get topological invariance of the bulk plus boundary system. And that's enough to ensure that the state sum remains finite. So it's a well-defined boundary condition. And the converse is that if you have a boundary theory, then we can, we can here it is, I've written it as the, as the boundary of, of, of our topological field theory. And then on the other side, I put some boundary condition and the boundary condition I'm gonna put is uh, what I call the Dirichlet boundary condition where you just don't allow the network to end. And that's a gapped boundary condition. And when we do this, we get a, this is effectively a D-dimensional system. If you think about this direction as small and it's gonna have categorical symmetry A because if we have any A line, we can modify this picture by saying that, saying that there has to be a line that ends at some particular place. So, so this would be a surface, this is like slice. So some surface that ends on a particular line here. And that is uh, enough to define the action of A in this slab theory. You can actually show that these two are inverse to each other. So that's this uh, bulk boundary correspondence. And if we do this for uh, very familiar systems, like our familiar uh, symmetries, like just Z2 symmetry, then this Terai Vera model is some Poincaré dual description of Z2 gauge theory. And we just get this result that if you have a Z2 symmetric system, you can gauge this with, that it doesn't have anomaly, right? Cause that's built into the data uh, that you can gauge it and then you can put it at the boundary of a gauge theory. So let's get that. And uh, if we take this category that we found from the Kramer's Vonian transformation and study the Terai Vera theory of that, that's an interesting topological phase with non-abelian anions. And in general, we're kind of curious about, uh, you know, what happens at the boundary of those systems. And the version of the phase diagram I showed you before, where you have to tune this energy operator to zero, you actually get that, that you actually get that fine tuning for free. So there's that energy operator is actually not even local at the boundary of this, uh, of this theory. So you get an edge phase diagram that has a completely stable gapless edge described by the Ising CFD, some seven tenths transition, 
into uh, a gapped edge, which happens to be this Dirichlet boundary condition again. This theory only has one gapped boundary condition. So let's see. Right. So you can do a number of things with this bulk boundary correspondence such as classifying the gapped phases. We know how to classify gapped boundaries of derived Vera theories. They're given by module categories. This Dirichlet, I won't, uh, I don't think I have time to tell you that much about module categories, but this Dirichlet condition is given by A acting on itself. So it's essentially, it's the only completely canonical gapped boundary condition you have, which is also why it shows up in the proof. But there's, there's more to it than this bulk boundary correspondence would suggest. And a big part of that is that you don't always have this kind of finiteness condition. You can't always define a state sum. You might not have finitely many simple objects that generate your uh, symmetry category. Of course, if you have some continuous symmetry, uh, ordinary symmetry doesn't fit into this framework. And I'm gonna show you in the remaining time some continuous families of non-invertible symmetries that are very interesting to try to come up with a mathematical framework for. I don't think we know how to do it yet. So let's look again at the circular sigma model. So I told you it has these, these two U1s. There's the one that acts by rotation of the circle and the one that measures the winding number. There's also the reflection action on the circle. And it also has T duality. So there's a, there's a moduli space of this theory, which is given by just, we just use the duality to fix the radius to be greater than uh, the self dual radius where it's, where the radius is unchanged. The transformation is like radius to one over two radius, or it depends on your conventions. And if we say so we have the symmetry C, we can gauge that and get another CFT and uh, we can do that at any radius. So we actually get a whole family. And these are called the, I'll just call them the, the orbifold branch. And so that's another family of CFTs with some parameter, which I'll write R tilde. And these theories are interesting. They only have a, they only have a finite symmetry group. And that's because C negates, you know, C doesn't commute with these U1. So most of them, most of them are projected out of the symmetry when you, when you gauge them. And the two families actually meet, they meet at, at, uh, at these certain values of the radii. So here's a picture of the moduli space. I'm sure lots of you have seen this before. Um, this I took from Ginsberg. And I'll tell you, there's lots and lots of categorical symmetries hiding in these theories. And there's ordinary symmetries hiding too, like at the self dual radius. So here is the, Here's the moduli space of circle theories, right? So here's the self-dual radius. And there you actually even have more than the, than the two U1s in the charge conjugation. You have a whole SO4 symmetry. And that SO4 symmetry really controls a lot of uh, what's going on in this whole picture. For instance, it, it tells you why these two meet here, which is that this is the orbifold of this point and at this point, the thing we're gauging is uh, equivalent to a rotation inside the SO4. So the, the gauging by reflection is dual to a gauging by a rotation and gauging rotations is easy. You just reduce the size of the circle by the quotient. It's a free action on your target space. Okay, but what about, uh... right. So what about the categorical symmetries? Well. Uh, just from this diagram uh, and how, how Ginsberg has labeled it with some of our familiar theories, we see we're going to have some categorical symmetries. Here is, uh, here is two decoupled Ising CFTs. And here we have, we can consider our Kramers Vanier transformation on either chain, you know, on, on either uh, copy. And so that's a that's a that's an Ising times Ising category. So two copies of this uh, sigma squared equals one plus epsilon category. 
you all, again, you only get a particular uh, value of the, of the F symbol of the two choices that you have. And this is some extension of the D8 symmetry. Actually the rest of the, so there's a Z2 inside one of the Isings and a Z2 inside the other. And sort of the other Z2 in the D8 is like somehow acting on them. This is not great notation, but you think of the other Z2 is like the swap symmetry that exchanges the two, the two Isings. But there's a lot more. And one way to construct a whole bunch of them all at once is, uh, so let, let's recall a little bit about how, what happens when you form the orbifold of a theory, which is that you start off, you start off with something like, I don't know, correlation function on a torus, something like that, or whatever it is. And then what you're going to do is you're going to start inserting your G lines everywhere. Whoops. And just sum over all of the ways that you can do that. And then, you know, make it finite using the topological invariance. And when you form this sum, there's a, a new topological operator that you can include, which is essentially just the Wilson line of the of the of the G gauge field. Here G is finite. So when we gauge a finite symmetry group, we get some, some dual symmetry, something's called the magnetic symmetry, which is given by the representations of, of G. For any representation, we can, we can look at the holonomy of this G gauge field and then evaluate its trace in that representation. And for non-abelian G, these will be non-invertible symmetries. So for instance, every single point on the Z2 orbifold branch is actually also a D2N orbifold for every single N. And the way you get that is you're going to start somewhere here, somewhere on the circular branch. You gauge a ZN rotation symmetry. It uh, changes your radius by some factor of N. So you end up somewhere over here. And then you gauge uh, C, and then you end up on the orbifold branch. And so by playing with the radii, you can always work backwards. And so it means that every single point on the orbifold branch actually has infinitely many non-invertible topological lines. So it has, it has rep D2N for every single N. So already, if we want to describe the categorical symmetry of the orbifold branch, we can't do it by anything finite. Of course, these are all finite subcategories that we can study on their own, but the whole structure is quite complicated. And it's actually even, uh, there's actually even more. Um, if we think again about these U1 symmetries and the circular theory, they're, they define a, uh, the way they define topological lines from them is you can impose boundary conditions so that you know, if, you have your, if you have your line and then you look at the field going from the left and the field going from the right, you can say that there's a jump in the value of the field by some, by some alpha. So it's like a phase slip. And this defines a topological operator. You can tell because uh, you think about the stress energy, it all, it's only derivatives of phi with, that appear. And the reason why this doesn't give you a topological line of the, of the Z2 orbifold is that it's not invariant under C, the thing we're gauging, all right? So C is the thing that negates phi. So it also negates the parameter alpha in this expression. However, the sum of lines, so you can, you can take sums of lines. Um, you could just define sums of lines by just summing over correlation functions where you just add this line or you add the other line. And that is C invariant, although it's reducible. So you would not probably consider it in the U1 theory, but because it's C invariant, when you gauge C, you do get something and you get something for every alpha. So this is a continuous family of non-invertible topological defects on the orbifold branch. And so you get one from, for both, uh, from both the rotation and the winding symmetry. And even better at rational points, every rational point can be related by some sequence of, of gauging to the SO4 point at the self-dual radius. And so more, <laughs> At those points, you get you get something like a like a SO4 parameterized family of topological lines. 
where the algebra is like the algebra of certain invariant sums of SO4 matrices. And this includes all of the rep DGNs that I mentioned come from orbifolding. And this is, uh, this is a lot. It's all we managed to find. It might be everything, but I'm not sure. Let's conjecture that it's everything if somebody wants to study this problem. But here's a million examples. Yes, Christoph. Uh, hi. Um, I was just wondering about these operators here. So it looks to me like when alpha is zero and when alpha is pi, actually they are C invariant. Yes. And then your sum of lines actually decomposes into like, like at these points, alpha is zero and alpha is pi. This continuous family of yes, exactly. invertible operators actually splits into two invertible operators. That's right. It's like the, the if you write if you draw this family, it's like parameterized zero to pi. Of course, alpha is identified yeah. minus alpha, and then at zero and pi, it it reduces. So I don't know if you want to draw a picture like this or something like that. But yeah, in I in the middle, like, they're they're irreducible. I feel like we should talk later separately, maybe. But I um, mm, yeah. my research involves stuff like this. So awesome! Yeah, I'd be happy to chat. Let me just, I know I'm out of time, but uh, I really want to advertise that these, these continuous families, there's another theorem. Whenever you have a continuous family of any kind of defect, you can say that there's a marginal operator on the defect that tunes the family. And when it's a topological defect, you can actually isolate that operator. What you do is like, here's your defect with the marginal operator on it, and you kind of fold and then use the fusion rules. And what you find in this case that there's, there's some line um, L. So the next step of this is now we have this. So this operator at the end is not a topological operator. That's a marginal operator. And it's uh, in general, it sits at the end of this line and it's a conserved charge. And in the case of the S1 symmetries that I told you about in this L alpha, say for the winding symmetry, you have this current D phi, which is not C invariant, but in the gauge theory, it can live at the end of the Wilson line. So we can just write this expression um, for some kind of non-local current, and it's conserved in the sense that the covariant derivative is zero. And we're always gonna have such a thing when we have a continuous family of topological defects, just because of the marginality, and you also get some spin one condition from wanting to preserve topological invariance of the line. But what I really don't know and would love to would love to know is whether there are currents like these, like these twist currents or whatever you want to call them outside of finite gauge theories. This is like a really easy example, right? Because you start with a theory that has a current. But in general, we'd like to understand like what, that these are uh, protected, some kind of protected operator in a, in a twisted sector of the theory that we can think of as a, as, a, um, as a conservation law. And it's really unexplored. It's really new territory. So let me just put my summary slide up and then I'll stop. I'll take questions. Oh, great. Uh, thank you. Let's thank the speaker. And yeah, uh, we have uh, time for a few questions. Uh, let's see. Um, I see. I see Lisa Jeffrey's hand up. Oh, but you're muted, Lisa. I was just clapping. That's all. Oh. <laughs> oh, right. Sorry, I make this mistake every time. Uh, let's see. Well, are there any questions? Well, I have, a, I have a question. Um, you mentioned uh, a few times this procedure of uh, summing over all possible topological types of network. Like for example, you mentioned it when you talked about uh, a way of thinking about the orbifold. And you said that um, you can somehow engineer for that sum to be finite. Uh, just, I have a naive confusion about that. If I just thought of like a torus or something, um, even if I have an operator uh, that's topological, meaning that it depends only on the homology class, don't I still have infinitely many homology classes? Like if I think of like a loop 
there's infinitely many homology classes where I could wrap that loop, right? Yeah, but if you use uh, let's let's say we're talking about uh, we're talking about like something like Z two gauge theory, right? Once you loop it twice, you can use the fusion rule to reduce it to not having any loop. Oh, I see. But here's here's a way that you can make things finite, but which it's not clear that uh, is well defined. Which is you can you can say triangulate, you can triangulate your space time, right? However you like. And then if you have finitely many objects in the theory, so finitely many simple objects, finitely many, you know, finite dimensional Hom spaces and so on, then this will literally be a finite sum, but you might worry that it depends on the triangulation. And that's where conditions like the Pentagon equation, things that the F symbol has to satisfy tell you that, uh, like a completely different way of thinking about the F symbol really is to show that uh, locally you can retriangulate this space and it doesn't change the sum. That's a little harder to think about. I prefer to just say like you have all these networks. The networks are more flexible once you know that you can have a finite sum of topological classes of networks. It's nice to just use the networks. I see. Thanks. That clears it up. Mm -hmm. Thanks but what about Andy's question for continuous cases? Yeah, so continuous case is, uh, I really don't know uh, what's the best way to talk about the bulk boundary correspondence um, in such nice terms. I mean, we, we sort of know how to do it for, say, ordinary symmetries. We know how to write trend Simons terms and things like that and think about like the gauge transformations of the boundary of the trend Simons term. So we want something like, yeah, you'd want, what you would want is like a state, is, is like a triangulation or like a, some kind of finite way of, sort of finite way of expressing the trend Simons form, say, if you just wanted to study U1. And that's an interesting question. I mean, people have studied that question. Um, but more generally, it's probably not going to give you a TQFT. I'd guess that that's, uh, that's more um, incidental that it does for the trend Simons theories. I might be wrong about that. But yeah, we need a better way to study the, to study the continuous ones. You can still think in terms of all the lines, like all the data that I gave you about the crossing relations and things like that. They will still be satisfied, but you'll just have some kind of category where the objects are have continuous parameters. Hi, Ryan, can I ask you a question? Hi, Alex. Okay. I, I missed part of your talk, so maybe you mentioned it already, so, but I'm gonna ask you anyways. Uh, so it seems like you have a, a bunch of these theories with some moduli space of them, and at some point you have enhanced symmetries or higher symmetries. Mm -hmm. In, in math, we have, you know, uh, like orbifolds and stacks and derived stacks, which are kind of the same similar thing. Uh, is there any part of these spaces that you think can be given some sort of uh, interpretation as a, like a stack or? So there's definitely something like that going on. I don't know if I'm <laughs> really qualified to give the answer to this question, but say like this point here, what we've done is we've, we've taken the theory where we just write the action and we just have this parameter, which is the radius of the circle. And we've taken a quotient of that moduli space, right? By this T duality. And so you might think that this self dual point is like somehow singular. And the way that the way that, that singularity shows up in this example is that there's this enhanced symmetry. I would love to know from some like abstract reasoning why it goes all the way to SO4 but at the very least, you can see that the duality itself has to act as some kind of symmetry. And that's kind of like saying it's, a, it's an orbifold point in that there's some symmetry enhancement. Okay. I don't know. Does that answer the question? I don't know. It was just kind of a... Yeah, it's a good uh, question, though. Good question, yeah. I do you. want to know why it's, why it's SO4. I mean, I can show it's SO4, but... Is that the smallest thing in some sense that it can be? That would be interesting to know. It just seems like you have all these points of like all every rational value you have all this crazy symmetry. So I, don't, I wonder what kind of space is there. Yeah, there's, there's other enhanced symmetries here. Like here, there's some super symmetric theories. I don't know if you can think about those coming from you know, some other moduli space. Some of these are like super symmetric uh, minimal models. Mm -hmm.
All right. Well, uh, if there are no more questions, uh, let's thank the speaker again. Yeah, thanks again for having me. And uh, um, please join us again. Uh, uh, the next talk is in two weeks, and it'll be uh, Ibu Ba as the speaker. Um, all right, so I'll turn off the recording.